I'm Wilson Lai. I'm Benjamin Yap. I'm Eli Sands. You're listening to Deep Cut. Hey, Wilson, how many times have you watched this movie? I've seen this movie twice. A couple? (laughs) (laughs) On Deep Cut, we compare a director's most popular film with a personal favorite chosen by one of us. We also discuss the director's life and career to bring in context that helps us view their movies as they may want us to. Before we get into our discussion on Frederick Wiseman's A Couple, please remember to subscribe to us wherever you listen to podcasts. If you haven't yet, please take a moment right now to stop, rate, and review us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever. Yes, hopefully positively, (laughs) but just truthfully, or just any review would be great. Honestly, yeah. Yes, and any other podcast provider that you're listening to to this episode on uh, because that will help more people find the show and in turn help us keep making the show you can follow us on twitter instagram letterboxd and facebook at deep cut pod so you'll know when a new episode drops and maybe some neat extra content Mm. last but not least check out our discord server where you can chat with us directly about movies the episodes that we release and anything else Write about us in your diary. Oh, yeah. (laughs) Tell a secret to a friend. Secret being, listen to Deep Cut wherever you find (laughs) podcasts. (laughs) The last and only other time we covered the legendary Frederick Wiseman on the podcast, it sort of seemed like we set ourselves an impossible task. Mm. So we talked our way through three Wiseman documentaries. His feature debut, which was 1967's Titty Cut Follies, which I remember all three of us having a hard time contending with the intense and visceral things that Wiseman Mm. showed us inside the Bridgewater Correctional Institution in Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. And we also jumped to the current end of Wiseman's career and his, I guess, institutions series, which were documentaries about institutions in the U.S. and Also, some in France, where Wiseman calls his new home in in Paris. And we talked about two mammoth documentaries, 2015's In Jackson Heights and 2020's City Hall, in which we focused in on Wiseman's careful sequencing and editing prowess, as well as echoing Wiseman's reverence for the work of a public institution like Boston City Hall and the community organizers in Jackson Heights in Queens. This was a total of, like, nine hours of viewing. (laughs) That's the length of one Wiseman documentary. (laughs) Actually. (laughs) But not his fiction films. Not his fiction film. And today, we slightly switch gears a little bit in our film analysis brains, and we will talk about a couple. One of only three... A couple of what? (laughs) A couple of films, guys. No, it's just one film. (laughs) One of only three fiction features Wiseman has released in his 55-year career. And based on Sophia Tolstoy's diary and letters sent between Sophia and her famed husband, Leo, we see a series of monologues from Sophia, played by co-writer Nathalie Botafu, addressed to her husband, performed for and at some points to the camera. Through these monologues, we get a sense of this relationship between this famous couple of artists, an often strained marriage filled with infidelity, shifting blame and responsibility, especially over their 13 children that they had to raise. Wait, 13? Yes, yes. It's a lot of kids. a little tidbit. (laughs) Yes, it's a lot of kids. That he never attended to once. (laughs) Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Jealousy? And a really strong and evident gender imbalance between the two. But almost shockingly, still a lot of love from Sophia. These monologues take place all in a garden, save for two monologues that bookend the film that take place indoors by candlelight as Sophia writes her letters. The relationship between Sophia and her garden surroundings remain unexplained, but also slowly grow in meaning 
to me as a viewer, as these backdrops seem to act in conversation with or even echoing Sophia's letters. Hmm. This was my first encounter with a Wiseman fiction film of his, and I surprisingly didn't find this dissimilar to the way that his documentaries function, at least from a pacing standpoint. I do, mm-hmm. at the top of this episode, have to come clean about me being the farthest thing from an expert in the works of Leo Tolstoy and the life of the author. I have not read any of his books. I have not seen any that? adaptations of any of his films. <laughs> Who is Leo Tolstoy? Wait, I thought you were asking rhetorically. (laughs) Let's do a quick Google search, and Ben, you can read the first paragraph of Leo Tolstoy's Wikipedia page. (laughs) (laughs) Guys, War and Peace, Anna Karenina. Yes, these names are ringing bells in my head of Uh, of, yes books of of books I've I've yet to read. (laughs) Books I've heard of. (laughs) Famous from books. Wait, I'm assuming Eli, you've you've read. These books? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe someday I will. But yeah. I've like heard his name and know what he wrote. Mm-hmm. I know people who have read them. So <laughs> I went to a school where they offered a class where you could read his books. <laughs> Close enough. Yeah. There was an option to. If I wanted to, I definitely could have read one of his books by yes. now. With that out of the way, and <laughs> I do feel like I still got a really holistic view of this relationship through this film. And I guess in a more universal and classic Wiseman way, I was able to peek into the struggles that a lot of couples may have. Um, Mm. And I do know that there can be a lot to dig into, but with my like limited literary knowledge, I feel like I'm just scratching the surface. But I did feel really sucked into this film, Botafu's performance and the simple Mm. and effective editing and camera decisions that were made by Wiseman and his team. So I really want to get into talking about what this little film does or what this little film fails to do and hear both your thoughts Mm. on it. And I also want to assume that this wasn't an easy watch because even though I enjoyed the film, I found (laughs) both times watching it, it being a, a tough watch to get through, Mm. um, even though it spoke to me so much. And I know both of you just finished watching. So let's start with Eli. What did you think of a couple? Yeah, I really admire the formalism of this movie and similar to what you said about the garden externalizing or moving alongside Sophia's monologues, I find that the edit in particular is a really fascinating echo of the content of those speeches. And when it cuts and what angle it cuts to, there are things like jump cuts and in the camera movement, there's handheld, there's panning. There are zooms. I don't quite know how to unravel it. And I think it would require a lot of close viewing and keeping track of what movements happen when. Like having a printout of the actual monologue and marking when certain camera techniques happen to really decode. Or maybe there is no code and it's just sort of felt. Hmm. Mm. But yeah, it was definitely a demanding watch, but that's similar to Wiseman's documentaries, and it's not a slight against them to say that it requires energy and focus if you want to get something out of it. But that doesn't mean that it's without pleasure as well. There's really lush photography, and needless to say, the central performance of Natalie Botafu is really gripping. And there's a lot of subtlety afforded by those moments when Wiseman just goes in on her face and Mm -hmm. has a close-up that lets you see what she's doing with her eyes. Really remarkable. And also, the ways in which it is using documentary interview-style staging, which Wiseman doesn't really use in his documentaries. I do want to talk about that more, especially the direct address moments, which at least for me, we're a first in Wiseman's filmography, um, which is really surprising given he is a documentary filmmaker and the direct Mm. address is a technique that is used by so many documentary filmmakers to get, I guess, closer to a 
specific perspective or a viewpoint by doing an interview. But Wiseman doesn't conduct his documentaries like that. So it's interesting yeah. that he chooses mm. to do this with a narrative film. Yeah. Totally. Ben, what did you think of this movie? I too felt that it was challenging to watch because of the formalism, but I'm a person who really likes the idea of formalism. Mm. Even if sometimes I will also think that it is not necessarily entertaining, but I think, mm. I don't think Wiseman makes films for them to be entertaining. <laughs> no. And that, sometimes <laughs> that, they are. Sometimes they are engaging, but I don't yes. think he seeks entertainment value. And I think with this, he is doing something very similar. And I've been thinking recently about like, what is like the function of films? And like, mm. of course we can't say that entertainment is the sole function of films, but it is one of the functions of films. So if that is the case, then what is the intention of this film? And I think when I think about that, it seems like the intention is for him to craft a portrait of a relationship, specifically mm -hmm. this relationship between the Tolstoys. But I think, you can tell from the way that he structures it that it, he is using very similar ideas from his documentary work where like it's about laying out a lot of things from a lot of angles to mm. give you a very kind of whole portrait of this. And of course, the angle into this portrait is one woman's like several monologues throughout yeah. the entire one hour. But it is still several angles at it. And I think... Is it entertaining? No, but does it successfully construct a portrait of that relationship? I think yes, because of the multiple different subjects that the monologues kind of take on that you kind of get a sense of the relationship. And also the performance helps to give those monologues a little emotive power so that they don't just become readings. Yeah. Eli, you said that you wanted to kind of see the text like as like, reading so they can really dig into like there's a lot of dense monologues here right and yeah. i also found myself like really just staring at the subtitles a lot because there are just so much material here and mm. part of me also wonders like would this work as just me reading it you know mm. how much does the acting really change the way that we understand this relationship how much does the mm. landscapes and the photography really change how we understand it and Personally, I don't think Wiseman necessarily does that much with the the kind of sight element of this, mm -hmm. the, or rather both sight and sound, to increase his kind of engagement with this core subject. Mm. But I think it's kind of wrapped up so that you can deliver it within a cinema. Mm. You know what I mean? It's like, you. this could be something I read, but it could also be this. And this is one way of doing it in this way for the moving image. And it is successful in terms of like that translation, but it was definitely yeah. not made to be an entertaining film, no. you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. And I think reading the subtitles also like made me think about how, oh, you know, there's subtitles where you can see the quotes, the quotation marks. Yeah. And that is like very useful for me, especially like, cause I don't speak French, but I'm wondering like if somebody was French and had no subtitles on, would not having quotation marks lose meaning and like get confused as to like when she is quoting or not quoting. Uh -huh. Whether she's quoting herself or she's quoting Leo Tolstoy, like it's also even with quotation marks, confusing. Right. Yeah. And like hard to follow. And like part of those parts make me feel like it's more of a literary exercise rather than a, like a like a, a cinematic exercise. Mm -hmm. But it's it's very fascinating. I think this being a part of Wiseman's filmography, being so late in his career and as you guys have both pointed out that I didn't even notice this idea that he is using documentary like elements that he would never use in his documentaries <laughs> for a fiction film is so it's ringing so many bells in my head that like there's no <laughs> messaging. It's just bells. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no thoughts, just bells. Yeah. And I'm just like, what is going on? And I, I do, I want to know what he's thinking when he's doing this. Ah. Uh. Mm. I always want to know what Fred Wiseman is thinking at any given point yeah, during the what day. What are we thinking right now? <laughs> I've been listening and reading to a few interviews to get ready for this episode where he talks about this movie. And I do think that 
he does say a lot about his process um and i think that was very enlightening but i also do think there's a part of him that keeps a lot of like meaning to himself um which i really respect which i really respect and I'm sure as someone who has done so many interviews in his career and has made so many movies about so many different things, him not speaking of certain things um, in depth and just letting the movie speak for itself is also very powerful. Uh, Before we get into a, I guess, a deeper discussion of the film and maybe some specific bits of it, let's see if some context and how this movie was made will help us a little bit in our understanding of the movie. And so this movie was made over the course of two years. Fred Wiseman previously worked with Nathalie Brotifo on a French theatrical production of the Emily Dickinson play, The Bell of Amherst. And that's when they started getting in contact and they became good friends. And um, Brotifo shared with Wiseman the letters or book of letters that Sophia Tolstoy wrote um, to Leo. And even though they've been, they were, the, this couple has been married for so many years, um, they often communicated with each other through letters, some delivered, some not delivered at all. But through these letters and th- through Sophia's diary, they both spent around nine months constructing the script, sending pieces of letters back and forth. In Sophia's diary, a lot of her addresses to Leo um, were in third person. And I guess the big shift that they did in in whilst creating this movie was in her diaries, she would always refer to Leo as, a, as he uh, and write about him as ah. in third person. So uh, the big shift that they did whilst like adapting all, all these letters into this film um, was to change it to second person addressing Leo as you, um, which I think was a very great choice, which made the performance much more confrontational. They were discussing making this film for a long time, and I think because of the COVID pandemic and Wiseman not being able to go out and shoot a documentary about an institution, um, he decided that this would be a really good time to to make this movie. So he had a friend who owned a garden on the French island of Belle-Ile off the coast of Brittany, who he contacted, who they thought would be a really great setting for this story or these monologues. And they shot in 2020. Production took place two months after the death of Fred's own wife, Zippera Batshaw Wiseman, after 66 years of marriage. Mm. Wiseman himself has been very, like, hush about the connection between the film and his own personal life. But I'm sure connections can be made. In a lot of ways, this could be seen as, I guess, a personal reflection from Wiseman, but could also be seen as an interest that him and Botafo shared um, that they wanted to bring to life on the screen. Last thing, I, I do want to shout out the two previous fiction films that Wiseman had made, which was 1982 Serafita's Diary, which was a collection of internal monologues of a fashion model, and 2002's The Last Letter, which was a long monologue about a Ukrainian ghetto during World War II, and both were sort of more staged theatrically um, and filmed in front of a stage. And in an interview with Eric Cohn of IndieWire, Wiseman describes this as his first fiction feature, even though he has made these two in the past. Um, But you can, like, just by hearing the descriptions of these films, you can see the link as there is only one performer in front of the camera and it is very monologue heavy. He directed a lot of theater in his career, right? He did. He, I think he dabbled a lot in theater. I'm not sure how much he directed, but he's very... Uh, yeah, working with actors is something that is not foreign to him. Hmm. Let's get into talking about this movie. So there's a bunch of different directions that we can take. I guess I want to first start out with considering this as a, as a fiction film and the other films that we've talked about in the past and the films that, of Wiseman that we watched in the past being all documentaries. Um, I want to 
do a little bit of like a similarities, differences, and mm. in form, but also in effect to us as the viewer of this movie. Um, what what sort of things do we think Wiseman's trying to relay to us, and does it work? I kind of talked about this in my first reaction, which is that he's trying to give you this portrait of this specific relationship and kind of allow Sophia, the character, to articulate her frustrations about the marriage, but also articulate her love for Leo Tolstoy. And mm -hmm. I don't really know how to understand it because it being a series of monologues, like this could be a dream sequence. It could just be dramatized readings. How do I understand the performance is something that I don't fully yeah. know. Yeah. But if you just go straight into the content, and I, I guess the content is just adaptations of these diaries. Yes, like it's, what I think it's a little iffy of what has been written and what has been like taken yeah. from a diary mm -hmm. entry. Yeah, and I think with each monologue, she's kind of attacking the relationship from different sides or trying to portray from different sides. It's like the frustrations, but also her love for him and his love for her. And she quotes him and she also talks about what he writes in his diaries about her, I think. Yeah. <laughs> and I think that's the part that's interesting because the voice of Leo Tolstoy is through her. And so she gets to pick what she says from his perspective. Right? Mm -hmm. And yeah. I think the fact that it's called a couple, but it's just one actor is a very, very specific choice mm. yes. of portraying a relationship from just one side. Uh yeah. And I think it is successful when you just look at the material and like how much it covers within the one hour of like what you know about this. And like I thought to myself, what would be the difference if we learned about this relationship through a more traditional script format or more traditional mm -hmm. story structure? I was thinking about that too. You know, right. we would set up the couple, look at their struggles, we'll look at them fall out, look at them being in love, look at them interacting with their kids you have this like you know period piece thing going on mm -hmm. and i don't know how it will end it would actually be so much more difficult for that film to cover the amount of ground he does in yeah. one hour yeah right? it feels extremely expansive just yeah by placing us within all these different monologues we really get a holistic view of this relationship there's um, no sense of time you know with the different diary entries you're just mm -hmm. going like you don't know when this is is it late in a relationship is it early like, what, when is this happening? Yeah. And, and it even seems at some points that Wiseman and Botifo are sort of jumping in time, like, back and mm. forth between these few monologues. And her attitude towards Leo sort of is whiplashing between yeah. loving him and hating him and being jealous of him and loving him again. Well, something that we haven't mentioned also is that Leo Tolstoy seems to be dead at the time of this whether literal or figurative rumination period I, of a day. I don't know if I agree with that. Oh. In like how I watch it. Mm -hmm. like of course Me he's too. presence, like of course he's absent in the film, but I don't know if I think that it is a sense of him being like dead. Mm -hmm. You know, I just know that he's gone in this yeah. film. And because it's so abstracted, like in terms of what's presented to us, it's just a woman in a garden reading her diaries to you that like it's you can't really place it in mm. in like realism it's this is not realistic actually when you think about it yeah, yeah. which yeah. is also curious when you think about that like this is not realistic well there's another similarity to the documentaries of frederick wiseman which is that in moment by moment slices things seem more literal and present and in front of you as they are mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but when you take all those scenes spliced together it's impressionistic mm -hmm. it's creating something larger and more nebulous than those literal slices of scenes in this case that are monologues and in the case of a documentary is a scene of a couch being thrown into a trash compactor mm -hmm. or a meeting or a confrontation, or a mm. memoriam. The larger sequence of events and the contrast from one moment to the next creates something 
that gives you a larger impression. Mm -hmm. And in a way, I'm sort of only pushing what has been said earlier, I believe, by Ben a centimeter further by saying that could we count this as one of his institution films as well in that sense that it is creating a picture of some setup or system through these individual slices. Mm. I would not disagree with you, Eli. Like, I'm sure wading into this movie again and sort of doing a similar thing to what I guess I remember both Ben and I did for In Jackson Heights, where we sequenced the scenes and what was happening in the scenes and seeing what characters reappear. And if this sort of approach to receiving the film was done to something like a couple, I feel like there would be a similar few light bulb moments of like, oh, this is what he's trying to relay by placing these two monologues next to each other and in between Mm -hmm. them placing a sort of rendezvous through flowers. Mm. Also, those moments that Wiseman lets us breathe and where the camera sort of similarly to his documentaries takes a life of its own and goes on its own little adventures into the garden or into the waves and like stays there longer than what I would say maybe a a normal documentary director or any usual director would stay on a B-roll shot or a B-roll sequence. But long enough for me as a viewer to to know that it's a Wiseman film and he's trying to get us mm. into that world for just 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 a little bit more so you can just be there present um, with nature, like presenting itself as honestly as they can, like many of Wiseman's other subjects in his documentaries. I guess my first question would be like, what do you mean when you say institution film do you just mean that it's about an institution because sure i guess it is it's about the institution of one marriage not marriage but one marriage Mm -hmm. yeah i think i count that okay yeah i think what is interesting to think about is like the approach because you talk about the slices of the documentaries that he makes and we know that wiseman is very intelligent in terms of like what he is putting next to each other and the sequencing to create subtextual messaging within his films Mm -hmm. where he has a point but instead of directly telling you the point he tells you through the edit and the sequence of images or scenes that you get has some kind of either messaging or narrative arc Mm -hmm. right well said the thing I think about now when I think about this as an adaptation for example is that like usually with epistolary like novels or collections it would be chronological Mm. but with this the fact that there's no chronology there is no sense of time Mm. is an idea that like if Wiseman goes into the institution and uh, picks different events or spaces to be kind of put in a certain order like he is kind of taking these letters and putting them in a certain order to kind of evoke something Mm -hmm. What that something is, I can't tell you because I'm not sure because I don't know what is happening. (laughs) (laughs) Like, this is so dense. I'm like, not sure what she's talking about sometimes. But it's kind of like the same thing that he's doing, right? He's like trying to find out how can I place all these things that I have? I have all these letters into a certain like order to say something or to evoke something. Well, let me ask then, at the end of the movie, how do you feel? Like, what are the things that you think about in those closing moments? Like, do you, how did you feel when the movie ended about Sophia Tolstoy? This is not a film that is emotional in the forefront. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So it's so hard to be like in tune with like what was happening with me emotionally or even intellectually when I'm watching this. Yeah. Right. Because it's not like it doesn't push those things up to, to the surface for me. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Uh, no, not that doesn't. there's nothing going on in my head, but <laughs> <laughs> just bells, <laughs> just bells. But if you were to at gunpoint ask me what I was thinking, <laughs> I think, okay, first of all, like the last scene, I guess, spoiler alert, is her writing the letter on, mm-hmm. while she's speaking to camera. Yeah. And she says some stuff that makes it sound like this is more dreamlike than you think it to be. Hmm. Mm-hmm. If I didn't feel anything, I felt her kind of anger or like her 
Yeah. Frustration. Like that's like yeah. the main thing I get from Sophia. Like she is frustrated. Like even despite her love for Leo, like she is annoyed. That's a shitty and situation like, that yeah. <laughs> she's found herself in. <laughs> yeah. Leo Tolstoy, not yeah. a great fellow, it seems. Yeah. Yeah. I felt stressed about okay. the future. Like watching this as a young person and thinking about relationships of the future and mm. relationships of the past, both romantic, platonic, familial, what have you. Mm-hmm. It makes me feel stressed about the ways in which relationships can fray or become mm. troubled by mercurial moods, as I think we all have. We all right. change what we feel, and sometimes that puts us at odds with people around us. Yeah. And yeah, I found myself getting a little anxious about that in a very long-term sense, because here's this woman at, if not the end of a relationship, then a very long ways into it. And she does have all this anger that I agree, Ben, I wind up feeling by the end of the movie too. Yeah. And a sense of time and energy wasted. Mm. Mm. It's kind of peculiar. Like I think when I think about the fact that she's reading letters or reading someone else's letters. And like, there's definitely a sense that they both know the contents of each other's letters and like diaries. Yeah. Yeah. And what's peculiar to me is that there is like a strange, like radical honesty thing going on (laughs) that I think feels almost Gen Z. (laughs) (laughs) Like, I don't know where I'm going with this, but Tolstoy, TikTok, especially modern times, like people don't really talk about what's going on with each other sometimes. Huh? Right? Uh, I don't know. Like, I don't know whether it's just me, but like something about half, like, like not addressing the elephant in the room or yeah, just like talking like around. Something about the understanding issue. this relationship through two people just saying everything out loud through writing is kind of fascinating. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I do think that's a big reason why Wiseman decided to make this movie and the texts, like the original text spoke so strongly to him. I did write a little bit about this during on my my initial watch of the movie and i think the subsequent rewatch that i had sort of got my mind racing more this weird not weird but like just really fascinating performance at the center of this movie that natalie Bur- yeah. butterfo gives and it's sort of a mix between embodying the character fully like a lot of film actors do do in their films or what is expected of film actors to do and also performing it as if the garden was her stage and Mm. like performing for that audience of the stage and like using her body to express how she feels and then you have another level of that on top of that which is the direct addresses to camera where she seems to be speaking directly to Leo in those moments where he she looks directly into the camera. And it just got my mind thinking about the relationship that Wiseman himself has with performance, be it the theater that he directs, the performers that he profiles in his documentaries, like La Danse or Ballet, something that comes to mind, or even like the performances in Titty Cut Follies, I think Wiseman has this really complex view of like a performer reaching into an original text or or a, or a text that they're supposed to like adapt into their own body and uh, words that they that come out of their mouths and like the final product. And I think there's like he's he's playing with varying levels of connection between Butifo her original character Sophia and as well as us the audience and like I have no conclusions to deliver to you two today but I do just have a lot of ideas about showing when a performer is fully locked in and also maybe moments where they let their stage like wash over them and I think it's just a really interesting performance with a lot of fascinating choices especially with when it gets a little physical and this does intersect with that earlier 
question we raised about why Wiseman is using interview techniques that would never appear in his own documentaries, but would appear in other documentaries. And that that sort of switches like these switches happen in the middle of a monologue. So she would be. Yeah, she would not address the camera or even be aware of the camera until until an important line where she she looks directly into a camera or it cuts to another uh, to a close up of her looking at the camera. There, there was yeah. one moment when she's like sitting on the beach where she is not looking to camera, but she looks like she's looking at somebody next to camera. Mm. Mm. And that was that happens a, a few times. Yeah. Is it? So mm-hmm. I noticed that this one time and I was like, like sometimes she like kind of looks off camera, but it doesn't look like she's looking at somebody. But this time I felt like she was like looking at somebody. Mm. You know what I mean? And I don't mm-hmm. know why I thought that way, but it was jarring. I don't know what it does. <laughs> It just is. But now that it makes me think about like what is happening when we are watching these monologues. And mm-hmm. there is a very theatrical component to this because like you think of a of an aside in like a Shakespearean play. Yeah. You know, or yeah. like or whatever play, you know? Sometimes asides can address a person but not be delivered to a person. Yeah. yeah. You know, and I have this very strong feeling when I'm watching this that she's not delivering this to Leo Tol, so she's delivering it as a character doing an aside, you know what mm-hmm. I mean? Yeah. See, and there's like, layers to it. <sighs> yeah. Like, I don't know what's going on in this movie, but <laughs> it's interesting. <laughs> if I could ask Fred Wiseman one question, it would be <laughs> this. In those couple of scenes when she's being framed like it's an interview and she's looking slightly off camera, was Natalie Botafu talking while looking at Wiseman himself or Mm. did she just have a mark to place her eyes on because you're right Ben they're fixed on a certain point they're not wandering around or off in the distance you know her eyes aren't glancing around she's looking like she's looking and talking at someone who's slightly off camera and if it's Wiseman and Wiseman put himself in that position of being spoken to as Tolstoy that would unlock a lot about how much this movie is in conversation with his own personal life, his feelings about himself as an artist who was married, his Mm -hmm. feelings about his late wife, his maybe concerns about their relationship, not to impose that on him without knowing anything about his feelings on that. I feel like that behind the scenes glimpse would tell us a lot. It's a classic My Wife movie. My Wife. (laughs) But really not really a classic My Wife movie. I feel like this is sort of like the farthest from a classic. (laughs) Leo Tolstoy, not a wife guy. I'm still mulling this idea of like using this, what we're calling a documentary technique in this. And I just like, Mm -hmm. it fascinates me in a way that I have no answers for. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Like, like, do you yeah. think he thought that when he used it? That, oh, you know, this is what people do in documentaries, but I never yeah. do it. Let me do it in a fiction film. Like, I don't know if that thought even crossed his mind, actually. Yeah. Like, I don't yeah. think... I, like, That's my true. My suspicion is that it didn't. But mm. it is... Huh. You know what I mean? The only thing he said in an interview was that, like, the d- direct addresses were supposed to be when she is speaking to Leo. Oh. Like that's the that's the shift. Like the it's the intentionality behind her her monologue during those points. Huh. But that still doesn't really explain that much to me because it's all second person. <laughs> yes, yeah. yes. Those very soliloquyish moments. Like, imagine mm-hmm. like oh you know whatever play and then like time freezes. Character makes an aside and then speaks to a character that's frozen but then cannot respond. Like that's the kind mm. of feeling that I'm getting from this. Yeah, mm. that could be um, this whole movie. Like a little aside, and then on a garden off off the coast of Brittany. There's just every every time she's off walking in the garden, she thinks these things. Huh? That's that's this film. You know what I mean? Ben, why do you think that Wiseman was not aware of those soliloquy moments as framed in a way that's similar to classic quote unquote documentary style interviews? He might be aware, but I, it's more of like me thinking. He's not intentionally doing it as like a sort mm-hmm. of 
meta thing almost because i don't think oh, wiseman is a person who like like a conversation with his previous work yeah like mean. i don't think so mm. because i think he's a very direct filmmaker i don't think he's yeah. thinking about these things like he's just like yeah. this is just a thing that he wants for this this is what's happening yeah and mm. like the reason they don't exist in those films is because i think he's just like i just want to show people doing stuff mm-hmm. you know that's like direct like yeah maybe if it would make sense he might have had an interview at some point but it's just maybe never yeah. arose that it would make sense in his films he does have documentaries that are very monologue heavy without the need of it conducting interviews like say something mm-hmm. like welfare which is a movie that i saw after we recorded our episode on Wiseman and definitely if we get a chance to revisit his older films, a film that I will make you both watch because it is <laughs> incredibly moving. And I recently put it on my <laughs> fake sight and sound ballot for <laughs> greatest films of all time, because I think it is that but good. real deep cut sight and sound ballot. <laughs> yes. Yes. But that movie is filled to the brim with heartbreaking monologues that reveal like i guess as close to the core of of, of these people's souls mm. as as they could they could reveal to uh, to us um so yeah i i don't think there needs to be a, like a interview format for 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 wiseman to to get these monologues out of of these people but i think this time when it's staged when it's planned when there's intention behind what he wants Natalie Butefo to do for the camera, it is a different story. And we, we question those intentions, as we should. The last big topic that I want to touch on before we close out our episode is the backdrop of the, this garden and um, Wiseman sort of saying that the the savagery of of nature is sort of mimicking the savagery of of this human relationship and i think that was quite poetic and and a good way like there's a sort of like a calmness on the surface that we see in in all the shots all the pillow shots of nature um that we're given we start seeing like animals attacking each other on the pond like little glimpses of how life is actually unforgiving and yeah what are relationships anyway (laughs) i actually didn't catch any of the animals attacking each other in nature i didn't notice the parts where like near the end there's like more decay or like you know the spider web start overwhelming the trees and like i don't know i guess it's he's using it as a sort of metaphorical imagery and it's apparent and you can tell yeah and i also think whenever she's performing for the camera there's he's always activating the frame this is something that i like think that happens very naturally in this film because they are outside um but i think it's something that like edward yang does so beautifully and i like always like go back to yang as as someone who is like textbook knows how to activate the back of a frame to like reflect a character's inner needs or or inner emotions and i think the biggest example of that in this is like a sort of heated uh, monologue that sophia delivers in front of crashing waves like accusing leo of of infidelity yeah. again and just not being there for the kids and sort of that anger that like she needs to muster to to shout over the sound of the waves is is only like backed up by the the image of these crashing waves and the sound of the crashing waves behind her and i think that was beautiful and and so simple and like i think it all comes down to to simplicity and and being clear in a way to the audience by wiseman by john davies and photographer by by himself in the edit like things are so clean like in in the way that we're led into scenes and we're let out to scenes like even within a scene there's a very methodical cutting in and then cutting out as the scene ends yeah with the simplicity of these film techniques that Wiseman employs uh like you're he's able to like reveal greater meanings from 
whatever is like in front of the camera, be it the performance or or the natural world behind it. Yeah, very nuanced grammar going on. The cutting in and out, those almost jump cuts, like in that moment at the shore when the waves are behind Sophia. First we see those waves and then he cuts back to include Sophia in the frame. But it's the same vantage point. And that somehow both jostles me a little bit and does not. Mm. It feels both noticeable from an authorial hand standpoint, but it also bolsters what she's about to do, which is vent anger about Leo. And, oh, this is just a technical aside question, but how did he get clean sound at the shore in those shore scenes? Is it a lav mic? It doesn't sound like it's ADR. It it seems like I think like... It, it seems like it's a lav mic, maybe mixed in with the boom with boom of the. Mm, it could just be a really though. good lav mic that has yeah. like a very very tight like range of capture. Hmm. I don't know. Hmm. Yeah, I thought the same thing. I was like, damn, this sounds clean. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Which again matches the cleanliness of the images that Wilson cited a moment ago. There is nothing in the soundscape that gets in the way of you accessing this performance and its surrounding nature. I mean, if like mm-hmm. if this was just like, oh, you know, here's a nice garden, like it's a very nice garden. Like, I really like the shots <laughs> it's a nice of garden. the garden. Like, it is very nice. It, like, is very nice. it holds long enough in each shot that like you get to appreciate like the beauty of flowers or like yeah. plants. Mm-hmm. In the same way that dreams are very vivid when you're in them and they feel very clear when you're in them. But then afterwards, the total picture, something doesn't add up. Time doesn't really add up. Mm -hmm. There's something off. It's sort of like the classic wise men lull you into the movie by my pacing of of these shots. Like, Mm. I would say it's an inexplainable thing, but it feels so the pacing of the cuts feels so Wiseman-esque because he's the one at the helm of it but like I can't even explain it it's just like how long he spends on this shot versus and then how long he spends on the next shot it's like like he's he's slowly easing us in but like I I have not seen any other director do it like he does like it just doesn't work I mean the film is slow like I can understand people falling asleep in this for sure but each <laughs> shot is not slow. And I think the trick, or well not trick, like I think it's very simple. He holds every shot for as long as it is interesting. Mm. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. and like basically he is just maybe looking at something and it's like, this is interesting. Not anymore. Let me look at something else. And I think maybe it's a very intuitive rhythm because I feel it like when he shows me a flower, a flower is fascinating for that first instant that i look at it oh what flower is this what is this shape and maybe there's like a breeze and it's moving and i'm like yeah that's pretty and then once my thought is finished we're on to the next like object or like thing you know right it's a it's still able to hold your attention yeah so i think very similar with like his documentary i mean this is essentially nature documentary in that sense but (laughs) same as his documentary films like he holds long enough on something for as long as it is interesting, you know, or like long enough on a sequence for as long as it is interesting. And then he moves on to the next thing. Yeah. Which is why you can sit through like four and a half hours of Ex Libris about a freaking library and like <laughs> stay awake. <laughs> yeah. You know, I was just thinking again about that story that I shared in our first Wiseman episode, where in the first time that Wiseman landed on my radar, it was because you two had just come out of a screening of Ex Libris and were totally blown away and kind of mesmerized and lulled. Yeah. There's a hypnotic power in how he cuts exactly when his attention decides that it's enough. Yes. More people watch his movies. It's (laughs) that's all we're saying. All we're saying. It's worth it. It's worth it. And again, it does require a lot, but it is worth it. And Mm -hmm. in a year where we've had... I, I would say it has been a really good year for movies. Yeah. I would still urge people to check this one out because it's different from anything else I've seen this year. I think it beautifully 
explores and engages with the the central topic of the movie, which is the relationship that these two have with each other. And I think it's incredible that even if Wiseman is 92 and will be 93 in a couple of weeks. Unreal. Um, happy early birthday. <laughs> happy early birthday, Fred. And still really making these movies because he wants to, because he's interested in these topics and these subjects means that us as creatives, as people who want to make things, there is an unending well of ideas and subject matters and things to explore in our lifetimes. And there is no limit to what we can create and what we can what we, what we can do as artists. That's nice, Wilson. I like that. We would like to extend a really big thank you to the folks at Zippera Films and especially Erica Hill, who acquired us screeners for this movie and we do all implore you to catch this movie when it comes out where wherever you are be it in a theater which i'm sure all three of us wish we could have seen this in a theater yeah and on streaming at your home thank you erica thank you thank you for listening to this episode of deep cut please rate and review because that helps us keep making the show be sure to subscribe to us where you listen to podcasts so you'll know when our next episode drops. Keep up with Deep Cut on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and Letterboxd at Deep Cut Pod. Join us to talk about movies on our Discord server, to which you'll find a link in the description. A special thank you to Justina Yam for our beautiful artwork. I'm Wilson. I'm Ben. I'm Eli. Take care, and we're looking forward to talking about more movies with you next time. Like when she's going ham against the twigs. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sophia versus tw- twigs.